at Stonehill College in beautiful Easton, Massachusetts, where the sixth annual South Shore Leadership Conference being put on by Community Connections of Brockton and the Family Center is happening just inside. Lots of leaders sharing their knowledge. We got some resource tables, all sorts of good stuff. Let's go check out the action. I would first off love to welcome you guys to the South Shore Leadership Conference. I am elated. <laughs> I am sincerely elated that you all came out on your Saturday morning just to meet fellow community members and to redefine yourselves as leaders. I am happy to see all of your beautiful faces. Y'all look good, which is always a great thing. For those of you who do not know who I am, I am Rowan, but you can unofficially call me Ro. Those two letters, you'll remember it, you won't forget. I. I just, like I keep saying it, I really am sincerely happy that you all are here, but let's get things started. We are going to have some spoken word artists come perform, words from the soul. It's always, it's always beautiful just to hear people express themselves through language. So one of our first spoken word artists is Sam. So Sam, can you please come up here and deliver to us your art? I guess I will open up with the poem which is entitled Human Potential. Today is about leadership. Today is about believing in each other, believing in young people. And uh, my definition of human potential is that we were all born with the natural ability to bring about excellence in anything that we choose to do in our lives. And so it doesn't matter what your race is, your color, the texture of your skin, um, your life experiences. Each of us as human beings was born with a natural ability to do great things. And the poem um, goes like this. The body is like a vessel, and if it's pure, it will re remain safe. But the turbulences of life's deceptions can influence actions to be unsafe. Thinking is a method, and through its knowledge, we'll learn the rules, diamond, emeralds, and rubies in this world are known as jewels. A comparison for us to learn from. In all of our efforts, there should be a rule that the value of our minds are greater than any of those Jews. If perchance you can correct me, just reflect on what I say. Stones of values have limited meaning, but the human nature is here to stay. Mankind's existence comes from progress, and this progress will help us all to rise above the heights of God's creation. The more we want, the more we'll strive. Liberation is no real factor, because if we're mentally and emotionally free, we need no walls. Self-determination of our purpose will keep us healthy and standing tall. Get a grip on where you're going and focus in on every need, step by step. We must always be planning to conquer life We'll need a strategy. Thank you. I do, um, I do work across the state of Massachusetts, uh, working in the 12 cities, particularly working with young people who have already got caught up in criminality. And the goal is to um, work with these cities. And Brockton is one of the 12 cities. Uh, they're funded by the state. Uh, and the goal is to uh, have each city develop a comprehensive service, uh, service strategy to work with these young people and to kind of get them going in the right direction. Pick one of those, right, that most connects with you. You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. And I picked that because there's things in your life where you go through and you can't change it. You know, it's permanent and it's what it is. But at the same time, you can't be thrown down by it and you can't be knocked down by it. And if you do get knocked down by it, get back up hard and get back up. I'm holding on to the podium. I always joke with my students that hold on for dear life, just in case you're afraid. Um, my first speech that I ever gave, I was petrified. It was at Brockton High School. I ran for student government because at Brockton High, you can't fit all the kids in one space. When they're doing an election, they have to be in a classroom on closed circuit TV, so you don't actually get to talk to the people. And I stared into the camera and the red light went on and I locked onto the podium 
and I froze. Uh, needless to say, I didn't win that election. I also um, decided after that speech that I was going to learn how to be a speaker. I was going to take a speech class. And at Brockton High, I had a public speaking class. I had Maria Lafort, who's the retired associate principal at Brockton High School. She was my teacher for public speaking, and she was also my teacher for a science fiction class. So I had her in both respects, and she was wonderful. Make sure you bring a cheerleader or two with you in that room. If you're the president, did you get elected president? Okay, so people supported you and voted for you. Okay. Don't sabotage yourself. You have cheerleaders, you have people that supported you, you have friendly faces in the room. Look to those people. Just, just be confident. Speak from your own personal experience, okay? Who knows the stories better than you? I always tell everybody anecdotes, stories, things that other people can relate to. Weave them into whatever you're talking about. Does that help? And like I said, find the friendliest face in the room. They're all, you, you're going to have someone sitting there like this. Don't look at them. The pros have speech writers. Okay. Ronald Reagan had some of the best speech writers in the world. If anybody remembers the Challenger explosion, slipped the surly bonds of earth and touched the face of God. I don't know who wrote it, but it was a great quote. You want to tell me that homelessness doesn't affect you? I beg the differ. If a homelessness were to come to rescue you out of a burning building, would you tell them not to touch you because they're homeless? If somebody were to put a gun in your head and, and about to shoot you, yes, I'm going to say, would you not want, if a homelessness was, can protect you, will you tell them not to protect you because they're homeless? That just show you, it's not, the homeless that we need to look at, we need to look at the person that is homeless. Mm -hmm. Most of my clients, I can say all of them because there are some people you just can't please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just can't please, but most of my clients, they enjoy me coming to them because I, I, I see them. I don't see the old person, but I choose to understand. Even the ones that are very difficult, I try to understand that, you know what? This person used to be able to get up and take a shower of their own. Now they can't do it. They rely on somebody to do it. And I can tell you, that is enough to make somebody bitter and angry. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> that is enough to make somebody angry and bitter. You think that your daughter needs counseling. I try counseling. Let me tell you. That's my experience. I'm not against counseling. I'm not bad-mouthing bad -mouthing any professional. Um, yes. The first thing she, I said to her within a conversation, I told her that I was depressed. And the first question she asked me was, would you like medicine? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Would you like medicine? And I said, no. I want to know what I can do. I went to see this counselor for three months and I got to a point where I had to stop because it wasn't beneficial to me. In this workshop, we're going to be talking about the skills that you need to be a productive member of society and just become like the best version of yourself that you can be. The question you could say is how do you handle conflict? So if any guys want to just like participate and like see how you feel, see like your view, you feel free to raise your hand. If it's somebody that I like or I care about, then I have a little bit more understanding. But if it's like at work, there's people that I don't know that I have a connection to, I'm just upset that much quicker and I sort of don't really take their feelings into account. So um, it, it sort of depends for me on the situation. Anybody else? Um, I confront it because I know if I don't, it's going to fall like the rest of my life. So I just get it over with. What is it about conflict that makes it so difficult to deal with and how come good people can turn into such monsters in the face of conflict? 
the most common way of dealing with conflict is to avoid it. Some people walk away, others get really upset, wide themselves up and attack, and others just get sick or go on stress leave. In fact, it's amazing what people will do in order to avoid conflict and the emotional stress that comes with it. There is a very clever saying that goes like this, denial is not a river in Egypt. Denial is, however, one of the most common problems when it comes to resolving conflict. When confronted with a tense or difficult conflict, too many people smooth it over, bury their head in the sand, and the conflict goes on for another one, two, or three weeks, months, or even years in some cases. I want to introduce you to a definition of conflict and then give you a pathway for the resolution of conflict. Before I do, I want to say this. For some people, even the word conflict means warfare dead bodies and blood on the streets. And it's very common for women and men to see anything less than that as not being in conflict at all. So this is a definition that starts at a very low level because most conflict starts out as very small upsets and builds and grows into a full-scale battle. So here's the definition. Conflict exists when one person has a need of another and that need is not being met. Now don't be fooled by the simplicity of this definition. The resolution of conflict starts from here and the first step is to express the need. The second step is to find out if the need can or cannot be met. If the need can be met, then we have resolution. If it's a no, then we negotiate to resolve the conflict or we go into the management of conflict. So here's the problem. Most people go straight from having an unmet need into the management of conflict, bypassing step one and step two because they are afraid and don't talk to the people who can do something about it. And that's not pretty. In fact, it gets quite ugly. So here's what the management of conflict looks like. Sulking, withdrawing, getting sick, the silent treatment, backstabbing, gossiping, shouting, blocking, being aggressive, and getting angry. So the resolution of conflict starts with expressing your unmet need and then finding out if your unmet need can or cannot be met. With that video, we were just trying to um, show how um, conflicts happen in our day-to-day life at school, work, and just how how important it is to solve it correctly and go about it the right ways. Because as you saw in the video, um, denying it and not confronting it head-on can lead to later problems in the end. I want to just say that in society today, we have to understand that it's important for us to have that sense of community. It's important for us to know each other. It is important for us to believe in each other because the one thing that we lack in society today is unity. Do y'all feel me? That's the one thing that we lack, it's unity. And I can go into a room, I could go on a train, I could go on a bat bus and I could see 40, 50 people sitting down and the bus is silent. How is that? Everybody is on their phones. And it seems like we rather communicate through technology rather communicate face to face. Do y'all do you feel me? Amen. Amen? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you see, I don't feel as if we have bad kids in our community. I feel as if they're lost. I feel as if they don't have an alternative. I say this all the time. How is it that our community, that is majority, like people of color, right? And what is the one thing that floods our airwaves? What is the one thing that we see on Facebook? It's nothing but the media portraying us in a negative light. Do you guys see what I'm saying? You guys ever go on BT or you guys ever go on Facebook and just see young youth fighting? You ever see them swearing? Don't you see the music we listen to is infested with sex, drugs, and violence? Don't you guys see that? What do you th- what do you guys think that does to the youth's minds? If that's all we're being fed, that's all we're gonna eat. Do y'all feel me? If that's all we're being fed, that's all we're gonna eat. And in our communities, a lot of our youth listen to the artists that promote nothing but sex, drug, and violence. So that's what they become. So it's not a thing of our students or our youth or followers. It's the fact that they don't have an alternative, an alternative to look forward to, to look up to. You see, if I only see in the media Chief Keef and I only see Young Thug and I only see these artists, I'm going to dress like them, I'm going to act like them, and I'm going to talk like them. That's just, that's just it.
Now, if I see somebody else that's being portrayed in the media as a positive person that is educated and that looks like me and is still successful, maybe in my mind, I could say, hey, I could take that route. Instead of having to be this, maybe I could be that. So my thing is, if none of us see an alternative, it's time for us to start becoming that alternative. So a lot of us say that we can't come together. We can't change. Brockton is always going to be violent. violent. Brockton is never going to become a better community. Ba -da -da -da. All this negative saying about our community, don't you think that putting that into the universe is exactly what's going to come out of it? Has that been working? Has that been working? Let me ask the grown-ups here. How, 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 you, how you guys doing? I know you have the power. You can either make the youth or break the youth. And I'm being serious. Because growing up, because of how the adults view me, that's how I base my life. So if the adults in my school, got you, I got you back. Because the adults in my school, when I was young, the way they viewed me was a troublemaker. The way they viewed me was as if I wasn't going to do this with life. At all. So that's exactly what I did. Now, when I found an adult that told me that I can't do it, then when I found an adult that believed in me and gave me a positive outlook on life, that's when I was able to change. And I was able to start moving forward with life. So we're talking about leaders. The people who can create the leaders are you adults. You guys are the start because you guys have the experience. We're new to the world. We can't learn something we were never taught. Happy to hear that. Very happy to hear that. Because <laughs> Some, some, a lot of, a lot of older people might not take us, might not want to take us as serious, or they might hear us and just put us under the rug. <laughs> man, you older people, man. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but one thing that I do see is that there's a division. You guys see this division? It's like, it's like, it's hard for us to relate with you guys, and it's hard for you guys to relate with us. Why is that? Ron had a ve very important article written about him in the Boston Globe in 2003, where he talked about his work for racial justice and the march that was going to happen to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Montgomery March. It's a fabulous article and it fell out of my office this morning. It almost it was like it fell from the sky. So I said, God just sent it to me because he knew that Ron was gonna be here today. I hadn't seen it in years. So I'll make sure this is available. I'll make copies and you can have it for future reference to know who you're going to be honored and blessed with in the form of Mr. Ron Bell. Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist and writer once said, we are one, our cause is one. We must help each other if we are to succeed. Repeat after me. We are one. Come on, we can do better than that. Y'all are young people. We are one. Our cause is one. And we must help each other if we are to succeed. If you believe that, clap your hands. The days of the one man show are over. It's going to take a cadre of leaders, black, Latino, Asian, and everything else in between, men and women, young and old, from all diverse sectors of our community working together to have an impact. These are challenges for all of us, especially with the upcoming presidential election. This 2000 election cycle is like no other. I'm telling you, this is like one of the worst elections I've ever seen in my life. 
The levels of negativity and discord among the candidates has left a bad taste in the mouth of many, many voters. I'm running a workshop today, community gardening. I need you to come because we're going to show you how to actually plant. We're going to be planting seeds in little cups today, and then they can be transplanted into the ground. Okay, the earth listens to you. If you love the land, the land will take care of you. And I'm not lying. You bring it from the garden to the table. When you bring it from the table, it is healthier. It's all organic. I'm going to teach you about red worms. Red worms grow to, the droppings from red worms grow the sweetest tomato. The worms irrigate your soil. If you dig up now, you're going to see some red worms in there. If you don't have no red worms, you need to put some in. And they sell them. You can get them free. All you do is go fishing. Fish love them. The dirt love them. You can't go wrong. So, today, officially, my name is Classy Parker. I'm from New York. I'm an urban gardener in the city of New York. I've been doing this for over 30 years. I was taught how to can how to grow things by my father and my grandmother. And they were the best of the best. When you gardening, gardening also builds community building. You get to know your neighbors, you get to see and know people. You learn how to name nay, and you learn how to do this. But that's what social communication is about. Community gardens build connections and connections that connect you not only to the land, but to other people, to other organizations. This is what we do. This is what I do on a daily basis because I love what I do. And don't be shy because I will volunteer you, okay? <laughs> I love to boogie and I love to work. I ain't no slouch. I'm 62 years old, but baby, I can still handle a wheelbarrow. <laughs> so, let us get busy. See, these are little tomato plants they grow. See how they come up, see the fur. Okay, they start out like this. What y'all gonna do today? You know, I like the way y'all plant. Y'all think it like, like gardeners now. Nah. And at the Family Center, we have community gardens that we're building, and we need people to come on out and plant my seeds so for please. me and take care of it. We need some weeding, some watering. 1367 Main Street, come on out to the Family Center and help us put a community garden in the ground. Please come and help the Family Center. We need your help to plant. More hands is better than less hands. A good organizer is a social arsonist who goes around setting people on fire. Someone say fire. fire. And their duty is to provide people with the opportunity to work for what they believe in and must be able to ch charge an issue with a supreme sense of urgency. Organizing is providing people with an opportunity to become aware of their own capabilities and potential. He says, you don't develop new leaders, you push people into taking action by refusing to do it yourself. You are then providing them with the opportunity to become aware of their capabilities. See, in my organizing philosophy, I believe the best experts are the ones closest to the problem. Therefore, we use non-traditional approaches to meet people where they are, talk about things that they think are important, and then we take action for, to make positive social change. You know, sometimes we take it for granted that people know how to vote. I remember when I was 18, I went into the polling location, you know, with a boss, a police officer, and had a, you know, one of our community elders, God bless him. But you know, a 15 hour day is a lot and you can be a little cranky. So I didn't feel welcome. I remember going in the voting machine. Y'all remember the old ones, you know, with the curtain? I remember opening the curtain. I went in, I was like, what am I supposed to do? I was so embarrassed. But there's a lot of people like that. People don't talk to each other. I realized that you say hello to them, they look at you. I went down south, right? You go down south, people are like, hi, how you doing? Yeah, right, how you doing? People speak. I remember coming back to Logan, I was like, yeah, how you doing? They were like, do you know what I mean? We become unrelational. So just talk to them, you know, ask questions. Because this average person don't do that. I'll tell you, some folks look like they want to kill you, you know, when they, you say hello to them. And smile. I'm telling you, it helps. It's easy to smile. 
Even when times are tough, this smile, it helps. As we celebrated last year, the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, I believe that working together, those that are here today can make the Commonwealth and the country a better place for its residents. So join us in our new movement called UC2 You Count. UC2 You Count. Built on the work of Dunk the Vote, UC2 You Count is a unique, nonpartisan, innovative grassroots movement. Young people like yourselves in communities of color, faith, and the hip hop generation in urban neighborhoods across America. Our work will focus on three areas. One, using community organizing techniques, including door knocking, phone banking, canvassing, leafleting, and other elements of the ground game as we did with Deval Pat Patrick. Grassroots organizing, meeting people where they are, talking about things that they think are important, then taking action. Number two, working with churches and colleges and community-based organizations, civil rights organizations and corporations for operation and execution. Last but not least, number three, utilize social media and multimedia outlets for outreach and recruitment. This is a pivotal time in our country. Young people in this room, we need you because you got the power. We need folk in this room to roll up your, see your sleeves and continue to do your work, but yet we need to get busy. I challenge everyone, everyone in this room to go back to your organizations, your community, and use your time, your talent, and your treasure to help create a new movement. It doesn't have to be basketball. Remember, you are the expert and you know what you do and you know what your community needs. Wherever I go, I can't escape from this mental prison. I feel like people hear me, but no one truly listens. Am I not being clear enough? Am I not telling the absolute truth? It's like talking to a priest and I'm lying straight through the booth. How long will this entrapment last? Will I get consumed to the point where there's no turning back? I know what I am and what I strive to be, but it's gonna take hard work similar to a horse weave made into a guitar string and a rock formed into a beautiful diamond ring. I feel that I'm in a routine that is a daily process, something that I can't break out of, something without satisfactory progress. Is it an image I have to create or can I let it be natural? Live my life out as fictional or actually play it out as factual? I fiend for change as a prisoner fiends for freedom. Only difference is some prisoners get parole while I am left behind crawl, crawling and sidetracked from what I truly believe in. I need a breakthrough. I need a sign, a path out of the darkness, someone to save me from getting left behind. Raped of my sanity, stripped like a clock wall's numerals. Am I riding on time to save me? Am I playing the victim or am I truly delusional? Have I fallen from grace like the devil himself? Or better yet, is the story of my life sitting up on his burning shelf? Is he controlling my every move like an ongoing game of chess? Just like the media portrays a celebrity, amplifying my worst actions and covering up my best. Well, unfortunately, folks, time has just about run out on the sixth annual South Shore Leadership Conference. We've had a wonderful day here at the Joseph W. Martin Institute on the campus of Stonehill College for everybody at BCA and One North Main. I'm Eamon Convey. We'll see you around.